Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and welcome to Prague Chattery 777. We are, of course, discussing Rush, and we've made it to Permanent Waves. Uh, this is their seventh studio album, and it was released in 1980, and uh, it is a fantastic record. It's a very interesting record as well. Um, you know, it was it was uh, hugely successful commercially for them. It was their uh, most commercial, uh, their most commercially successful album up to this point, uh, and it also contains some of their you know best known, most beloved songs. So it uh, it is definitely an essential album in that regard. Uh, but it also heralds a great time of change for the band. If, you, if we go back to uh, Hemispheres, you know, as I said in that video, Hemispheres is it, it kind of marks their ultimate prog rock. Magnum opus, you know, it is the peak of their extended songwriting, the conceptual songwriting, and it's, you know, it's like Hemispheres is really their ultimate statement as a prog band. And once a band makes that ultimate statement, there's two things they can do. They can either carry on doing the same thing, repeating themselves until it gets boring and dull, or they can change things up a bit. And uh, Rush opted to change things up a little bit. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Hemispheres was just exhausting for them to make, you know. And touring it was, was getting to be quite uh, complicated, so I think they were happy to change up the formula a little bit. So the change on Permanent Waves comes in a number of different ways. Um, most notably, the song structures are much, much shorter. Um, there's still a couple of epics on here, um, but you know even the epics are much more condensed and much more, um, uh, you know, I guess, song-oriented. So that's, that's a big thing, and, it, and it's not, you know... While, the, while this is more a more of a song-oriented album, they're still very much in that progressive mindset. There's still lots of uh, really cool, intricate arrangements and uh, really, really great bits of playing on this album. There, there's some fantastic, you know, ultimate, definitive rush moments of uh, in terms of performance on here for sure. Um, the other big change comes through Neil Peart's lyrics. Uh, this is the first time that we see him really depart from the sort of fantasy themes and the sci-fi themes. And he opts for a more real-world kind of approach to his lyrics. Um, there's some, you know, more philosophical things, but it's it's definitely definitely focused on the real world more than uh, more than the fantasy world. So that's interesting. The other big thing that I notice uh, with this album is uh, it marks a change in Geddy Lee's singing. Um, you know, the previous albums he was much more into that heavy rock and roll style, and I mean he hits those real high notes and he just wails. Uh, whereas on this album, you know, he is much more melodic and he's much more uh, articulate in the way that he's singing. And I think that, you know, that just naturally came about um, from doing the shorter song structures. Um, you know, the, song, the, the songs are a lot shorter because they're much more focused on putting a song together rather than uh, putting together a huge conceptual suite and, you know, putting, you know, right in, the, right in the music to suit the conceptual thing or vice versa or whatever, however they did it. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's all very interesting. But, uh, you know, the end result is a very, very good album, and um, even though it is one of their most successful, most well-known albums, um, it is very much a transitional record, and uh, that's what makes this period so interesting. Um, you know, Permanent Waves and the next album, Moving Pictures, um, you know, in addition to being Rush's, you know, two of Rush's very best albums, um, they're also very much a transition in two phases. Ultimately, Rush went from being, uh, you know, the big 70s prog rock band with sidelong suites and epics and crazy instrumentals to a sort of heavy new wave band in the 80s you know, that was very dominated by the synthesizers. And uh, that, tra that transition comes in two phases. This is the first phase and then moving pictures is the second phase. Um, <clears throat> so the first phase means that they're still very much in that prog rock kind of you know, mindset. Like there is the extended songs, there's the crazy arrangements. Um, and it's still very much about the playing, in addition to the songs. Um, whereas Moving Pictures, it's still in that proggy setting. There's an epic on Moving Pictures, and there's still lots of the arrangements and whatnot, but the synthesizer is much more dominant on uh, Moving Pictures. So um, that's very interesting, is, you know, e even though they are, this and the next album are transitional albums, they are two of Rush's best albums. I think that's what makes them so good, is it captures them in that perfect balance between the long epics and, um, you know, the, the synth rock. But uh, we're talking about this album specifically, so um, <clears throat> I'll uh, move forward with the tracks. So it opens with "The Spirit of Radio," one of uh, one of their great songs. This is an absolute anthem. Um, it's uh, I, I love the you know, the opening. Right away, we still see the chops, and we still see you know their um, their great playing with uh, 
Lifeson doing that great leg, and um, Lee and Peart uh, syncopating that rhythm. So uh, I love, I love that whole section. I learned that song and I played that in a band a long time ago, and uh, that syncopated bit always stays in my head. There's lots of lots of really really great riffing and. Um, you know, it's it's an absolutely stellar intro to uh, to the album, and uh, you know, fans of the prog stuff, you know, because of that, those intri intricate arrangements and whatnot, you know, it it welcomes them as well. Um, and there's there's a, there's you know quite a few different riffs, but I mean, it, it's all you know, all the riffs are there to service the song. It's just, it's a nice tight arrangement that goes through all kinds of different cycles, and uh, yeah, it's great. Um, the chorus is excellent. We got Pierre messing around on the xylophone a little bit, and. Um, you know, what can I say? It's a very famous song. You know, lots, you know, people that aren't fans of Rush know Spirit of Radio. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, lyrically, it's, uh, very much about the spirit of radio. It was actually dedicated to, um, Toronto ra radio station called The Edge, I believe, which is still, uh, functioning, but they don't really play Rush anymore. It's, uh, it's a hip channel. I don't like it quite so much as, uh, perhaps the jazz channel. But anyway, <laughs> um... Yeah, it's, it's a great song, and uh, one of the notable things with Spirit of Radio is towards the end, when we get the bridge, um, we see them experimenting with reggae, so they're starting to bring some new sounds into the mix as well. Um, and that reggae influence had become much more uh, predominant um, as they got deeper into the 80s, which is interesting. So that Spirit of the Radio marks the first, the first time they sort of flirted with that style. Um, but yeah, great song. What more can be said? Great solo in it as well. Great uh, solo from Alex. Uh, but then we get to track two of side one, which is Free Will. This is another huge song on the album, no, another um, huge, huge hit for him. And uh, it's great because uh, it's in 13-8. Um, so what's better than a hit in 13-8? It's kind of, I think, it's the same with um, Turn It On Again by Genesis. And that was released in the same year. So 13-8 was just, uh, that was just the pulse that people were, were uh, feeling in 1980, I guess. Uh, but it is a great song. Free Will is much heavier than uh, Turn It On Again. Um, and it, again, it's got, it's got those intricate arrangements with, uh, you know, uh, Lee and, uh, Peart, uh, syncopating, uh, a riff that, uh, that Alex is doing. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Again, lyrically, it's much more in the, uh, real world, uh, sort of thing. And it's, it's, it's a great set of lyrics. It's, the album is outrageously positive. It's one of the things I've always noticed about it is that, uh, it's one of those rare glimpses where, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to write a song about heartbreak and sad things, because um, it's a more immediate emotion. Um, but Peart does very well to work with very happy, positive, uplifting sort of themes on this, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, the, the, like I said, the riffs are really, really great and free will, but the real thing to write home about with this song is that middle section. I absolutely, I think that's a... That's a highlight moment in uh, all of Rush's career. I love when it kicks into that, and we get that bass line. And uh, that is one of my all-time favorite Alex Lifeson guitar solos that comes in there as well. Um, you know, there's all kinds of great soloing, all kinds of great licks, very atmospheric. And then when it gets to that, that climax... Just it, it's just fantastic, and uh, they pretty much they play free will pretty much every co every single concert, and it's always a highlight when that section comes up. Uh, just terrific playing by the entire band, and um, bravo to that. And then it winds its way back in, which is great. Um, classic track, um, and a big hit, and it's cool that it's a hit because it's in 13 eight. Uh, moving on to track three, we get Jacob's Ladder. This is the first epic of the album, and um, definitely more in the vein of uh, Farewell to Kings or um, or Hemispheres. Uh, not as good as the stuff that's on those albums. It's still really good, you know. I, I still always enjoy it when I listen to the album, but um, you know, Jacob's Ladder. It's it's it still falls a little short of Spirit of Radio and Free Will as well. Um, of course, the song is literally describing the uh, phenomenon that you can see sometimes, you know, if there's a storm cloud and then you see that ray of light uh, from the sun off in the distance, they call that a Jacob's Ladder. And um, 
not much lyrics in it. There's a there's a there's a little bit of vocals at the beginning and the end, but um, it's all about the instrumentation, which um, is sort of a musical representation of seeing the storm clouds and then finally the sunlight breaking through it, uh, which is quite cool. It's 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 almost like a rush bolero. It's kind of it's got that dun 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 dun. Uh, kind of got that whole, whole vibe. A bit of a bit of a crimson influence towards the first half, um, but it is very rocky. It is very heavy. We kind of get a classic, uh, classic heavy rush riff. Da na 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 na. na. Uh, and towards the middle of the song, the synthesizers come in, and that represents the sunlight coming through, and it becomes much more uh, happy and optimistic. Um, but yeah, yeah, like I said, it's 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 good. Not one of the best on the album, and it's not quite up to the par of um, anything that's on Hemispheres or Farewell to Kings, but uh, hey, I'm glad that it exists and it, uh, it fits on the album. We flip the album over, we flip around to side two, and we get Entre Nous, a nice French title. Um, and uh, this is this is kind of the, the deliberate, accessible song on the album. Remember, they always kind of did that, you know, Closer to the Heart. Um, one of their biggest hits was it was on uh, one of their proggiest albums, Farewell to Kings. Um, and, um, in a lot of ways, Entre Nous almost feels kind of like a follow-up to, um, Closer to the Heart. Um, I think on the whole, Closer to the Heart's probably the better song, but I enjoy Entre Nous more just because it's not as well-known, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice little song. Um, for me, this is the weakest lyrical moment on the album. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, the, the melody is really good. I really like the The chorus is very lush and the sounds are great. Those acoustic guitars sound very, very nice and, it, like I said, very lush sounding. Um, but the lyrics are almost, um, you know, they're just on the line of being cheesy and uh, a little bit naive. But, um, you know, again, it's, it's a different style for Pierre, right? He's still honing in on that and he, gets, um, he got much better as he went along, of course. Uh, but yeah, I still I still quite like the song. It's got a very kind of big sweeping um, arpeggiated bit. And it just kind of ramps its way up, and then the verse is kind of a bouncy, you know, friendly poppy sort of a thing. But it's all about the chorus. So those acoustic guitars, that lushness of the chorus is so nice. Uh, and then we move on to uh, track five on the album, which is different strings. Now this uh, I think is the single most underrated Rush song. Um, I absolutely love Different Strings, and um, you know maybe part of the reason that I like it is that it's not one that you hear very often. I mean, I'm not even sure if they even played Different Strings live. Um, and they played a lot of their obscure songs live, so that's uh, that's saying something. But um, I think it, it might be a contender for best song on the album. It's certainly the song that I enjoy most off the album, because again, you know, pretty much all the other songs you hear so much. You know, you you always you can't get away from hearing "Spirit of the Radio" from time you know, time and time again. You can't get away from you know, "Free Will," "Natural Science," of which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is a very very popular track. Um, but every time I listen to this album, "Different Strings" is the one that stands out to me because it always takes you by surprise. Um, it's very much in the mind. It's very much in the vibe of like a madrigal from uh, "A Farewell to Kings." Or some of the lighter bits, like the first half of the trees, like the acoustic bit of the trees, but it's better. It's way better than both both those, I think. Um, there's one moment where where uh, Pierre mentions a dragon, so there's a little brief uh, bit of peppering of the fantasy lyrics there, but uh, uh, no, it doesn't matter. It's so so good. Uh, I love the little instrumental break towards the middle, uh, the middle, and. Um, at the very end, it's got a really, really great little uh, Alex Lifeson guitar solo as well. But uh, yeah, it's really good. Very chilled out, very acoustic, but one of the, one of the single most underrated Rush songs in their entire catalog. And uh, I'll say it right now, it's probably my favorite on the album. Anytime I listen to it, it's the one that, that stands with me. So there you go. Uh, moving on to track six, the final track on the album, we have Natural Science. Natural Science. Uh, stuttered a little bit there. Uh, but yeah, this is uh, this is the big epic on the album. Uh, this is the this has got the most in common with uh, uh, you know the farewell to King stuff, twenty one twelve stuff, hemisphere stuff, uh, and it is probably their best epic. It is really 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 good. Uh, probably the P you know it, it's it's only about nine minutes long. You know it's not as long as um, not as long as twenty one twelve or uh, hemispheres or any of that. You know. 
I said in, I said in the Fair Hold of Kings video that you know Xanadu might well be one of my favorite Rush tracks, and that Cygnus X1 is one of the ultimate greatest moments of Rush. And I still stand by both those statements, but there's something very special and definitive about natural science. Um, <clears throat> it is the sort of extended, um, it is the extended uh, proggy song, the epic, obviously. And it's similar to songs like the Necromancer in that it's divided into three sections. But uh, the sections seek, to, seek together seamlessly, and um, you know it's just great. You know the, the introductory acoustic bit is it works so well. Great atmosphere to it. Um, and when it goes to the middle section, the, the kind of fast arpeggiated bits, and there's lots of unexpected changes and whatnot. And uh, the final section, the big triumphant sort of happy section, the march. Uh, it's all just so very good, and it's so well arranged, it just works perfectly. Um, and again, lyrically, it's not really, it, it's, it's as, as the title would imply, it's more scientific than it is um, in the realm of fantasy. So that, that's very interesting, too. Um, and I think it, you know, in a lot of ways, it is probably their best epic, and it, that's evidenced by the fact that um, of all their epic songs, extended songs, I think Natural Science, they've... They've brought back the most in recent years, aside from 2112. They always played sections of 2112, but um, yeah, there's something very special about Natural Science. Um, definitely, again, contender for best song on the album. Uh, it's it's Natural Science and different strings for me. The end of the album is really really good, but um, yeah, the other thing with Natural Science is it pretty much invented Dream Theater. I mean, I was a, I was a Rush fan long before I was uh, before I discovered Dream Theater, but. You know, with all these riffs, these riffs that get cut in your head, you know, things like you know, that from natural science that, you know, when I got into Dream Theater, I for the longest time I'd always think of that as a Dream Theater riff, but of course it's Rush and it was done 10 years before Dream Theater had really made their big impact. So that's all well and interesting. Uh but yeah, I think that's uh that concludes it for permanent waves. Um like I said, very interesting album. It, 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 uh, in addition to being one of their best albums, it's also still a transitional album. And, um, you know, it's great. It's essential if you're a Rush fan. Um, so go out and pick it up. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for, uh, for putting up with my near incoherent ramblings. Um, if you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, comment, join the conversation. And... Um, you will see me in the future for more Rush Chats. The next one is, of course, Moving Pictures. See you then.